Today, we are going to talk about upside at the running back position. We love Javante Williams, but you have talked about four young running backs who are dynamic. And they are a fraction of the cost of one Javante Williams. So I'm looking forward to talking about that today. It's going to be it's going to be a fun one here as we dive into it. The running backs. I don't know how you want to do this. Do you want to just dive in? Are we giving out the running backs? We're we going to go through them one by one. Are we going to give out all the names? Are we going to leave some as uh, teasers for people to check out in the article? How are we? How are we going about this? Well, why don't you start by picking your favorite here? This is part two after we had the veteran running backs with gaudy peripherals who are getting ready to smash ADP a couple weeks ago. Now we're looking at second year players or third year players who maybe missed a season. And as a result, people are forgetting about them a little bit. Colin, the first thing we have to make sure we address here is that these are small samples for some of these guys. And so we're not looking at this in the same context that we would look at a 250 carry season for a veteran superstar. That's not what this is. This is looking at guys who maybe got limited opportunities as rookies, not necessarily surprising. We expect their role to expand a little bit. And in their opportunities, in their debut seasons, the shots that they got, they continued to build on what we saw from them in college. One of the things that we want to make sure that we're always looking at is this idea of these players don't start or jump into existence as NFL players without having been somewhere before. So whether or not that player was a star in college, whether or not that player brings elite athleticism, those things matter. It's not some type of blank slate. So if we have some players who were maybe undervalued prospects and then come to the NFL and look like game breakers, even if that isn't a limited sample, those are at least players we want to have on our radar, start to create some exposure to you and I over our drafts the last several years and really the zero RB candidates list stretching back to its very beginning and even sort of pre road of when I was targeting these guys in my own high stakes drafts, we know that rounds eight through rounds 12, such fertile ground for landing the potential league winners. Some of these guys fall into that area and not every player in that round eight to round 12 range is going to be the same. Some of them maybe don't have the upside that we want to spend our limited number of picks in each draft on, but some of them do. So we got four names here. Do you have a personal favorite? It's, you're asking me to pick my favorite out of uh, four of my favorite guys in the entire NFL. So you're like your four children here? Yeah, that's what I was going to. I was going to make that joke, but then I thought I have one child, so I probably shouldn't make that joke about uh, running backs in the, <laughs> the mid rounds. But uh, when we uh, look through the names, there's one that's going a little bit higher, so we'll maybe leave that to the end. But the name that I've really been drafting the most, my highest drafted or rostered player out of these guys is Kenneth Gainwell. And you talk about it in the article that his rookie season was a little bit odd. Like the season started out great for him. It looked like, whoa, this guy's going to be a breakout star as a rookie but what you highlighted in it is basically we need to get this guy on the field because he only had more than 40 percent of the team snaps on two occasions but he did score 15 points or more on four different occasions so like if we look into week from the bye week really in week 14 for them last year he had eight percent three percent 13 percent and i think there was a show where i joked about that at that point he was on the, the back of a milk carton week 18 he then goes, and that's the week where obviously the game really didn't really matter all that much ahead of the end of the season. So when we look through how things played out, he had a massive snap share in that. That is one of the games where he was over 40%. He was at 53% in that game. But when we look at how the combination of things in this offense works out, the main thing talked about Miles Sanders this offseason is that he, you know, his lack of touchdowns last season i talked about kyle pitts only having one touchdown and i'm saying that well he's going to score more this year there's a lot of conversation around miles sanders should score more this year but i do think that at the current adps of both these guys miles sanders feels like he is a dead zone running back which then leads to me looking at kenneth gainwell as somebody with those peripherals entering his second year that is somebody who can become a focal point of this offense 
And that's exactly right. Miles Sanders is sitting there in the dead zone. He has a trait that I like a lot and a lot more than most analysts where he's one of the most explosive pre-contact backs in the NFL. He's had a couple of seasons now, I believe, with 3.0 or more yards before contact per attempt. He hasn't been able to be a guy who has been that same caliber runner after contact, which coaches will sometimes look at and feel like, okay, well, this guy's giving me yards, but he's not giving me yards in the way that are like true gritty running back yards. And so I'm going to go ahead and put him on the bench anyway. I mean, yeah, he runs to daylight, but if the defense is there, he gets stopped. You know, I don't feel like that's very macho. So we're going to go to the next guy. Obviously Sanders has had some other struggles as well with staying healthy in those types of things, but he does give you an elite athlete and a potential star back in this offense that could be very dynamic in 2022. You mentioned him in the dead zone. That is a little bit of a concern, but still Sanders would be, I think, the guy if these players were close in price, but they're not. I mean, Gainwell really falls out of that range, that 8 to 12 range that we talk about a lot. And if he's in round 13, round 14, the discount that you're still getting between what you have to pay for him and what you have to pay for Sanders is significant. And... Gainwell in those limited touches last season was fantastic, right? He had a 21% evasion rate. Boston Scott, the only other back on the Eagles, even a 10% evasion rate. It's hard to understand how a guy who did that and looked dynamic when he played, why he would be benched so frequently, if not for some of the rookie types of mistakes that teams are wanting to be avoiding. He had a 14.7 broken tackle rate. That is superstar level again it's just on on a sample to where if you break a few tackles you're going to look good so we're not saying okay well this guy is, is Derek henry or nick chubb or anything like that but if he had even done what he did and had been bigger than 201 pounds i, I just don't think that you look at it the same way as the coaching staff and bench him but the flip side of that is that he did lead the eagles with 50 targets he wasn't necessarily as explosive as a receiver but the route profile was really cool. You talk about this Eagles offense where perhaps it's not going to be that valuable for the running back because you have this running QB. It's very encouraging that he was number six among all backs in targets per route. He was number six in air yards. That doesn't mean that he's going to end up as some pass catching star or even that he's going to play a lot, but the fact that he has this 4-4-2 speed, and again, anybody who is below 4-5, that's always been a big positive. Once you start to get out in that 4-4 range, then you have the type of speed that can change games. And so from that perspective, we like it. And you know, you go back to what he did in college where in his final scrimmage season, he goes for over 2,000 yards. He catches 51 passes. This is a hybrid back, and... On our previous show, our Q&A show, we talked about Aaron Jones and why aren't we a little bit higher on him and talked about that mid-second round price, which you know is frustrating because we like these small, incredibly dynamic backs. The opportunity to buy into a back like that comes with someone like Gainwell, who you know, if he were just even a little bit bigger, everybody would be on him. But because he's not, you have this opportunity to get a potential game breaker at such a discount that, I mean, he doesn't even have to end up being Aaron Jones to, and we're not necessarily saying that he will. I mean, Aaron Jones, one of the best running backs in the NFL, but the different scenarios in which he can outplay his ADP are so favorable to you as a drafter that you want to make sure you have some exposure. Yeah, and there's times where I'm I, I mentioned this at times when we're doing these drafts. Sometimes I wonder is there too much there in terms of the exposure? But yeah, Gainwell's somebody who I think is very exciting heading into this season. The other one, Sean, you mentioned, and this is a backfield where we really like both guys. So you mentioned there's some things you do like about Sanders, but the New York Jets backfield with Brees Hall, who we've been drafting quite considerably, but on the drafts that we're not drafting Brees Hall, we're trying to get Michael Carter in the, the majority of those drafts and he showed some very favorable things last year in terms of broken tackles. Uh, you know, I, I thought that he was kind of unfortunate when it came to the draft that Brees Hall landed with him. I think we would be looking at him very differently in terms of ADP if Brees Hall wasn't there. I thought he had a very strong rookie season, but obviously we have to consider now that the Jets have, have gone and drafted a very 
high capital running back in this year's draft. So when we look at it, I'm hoping that we get Brees Hall out the gate looking fantastic. But you've talked about how sometimes the rookies take a little bit of time to come on. Maybe it's the rookie rather than the veteran that picks up that injury, unfortunately. And if that is the case, then Michael Carter is in a, in a, a tremendous spot. And I do think that he will have some standalone value regardless of if both are healthy. Uh, I still think that we'll get fantasy points coming the way of, of Michael Carter based on what he showed in 2021. I think you're absolutely right. And it's easy to forget just how good he was in college, right? Averages just two ticks under eight yards per carry. As a senior, he catches 82 passes across his four years. He had the best breakaway rush score among top running back prospects from that class. He had a 97th percentile agility score. I mean, those are the types of numbers that give a back, you know, in his size range, that sort of Austin Eckler type of upside in a best case scenario and then he comes out as a rookie and when he played he was fantastic right and you're talking about fantastic with the jets and that's going to be a little bit more of a limited offensive environment the jets so, weren't fantastic he was well, fantastic. They, the jets weren't fantastic the jets were not awesome last season especially when zach wilson played who you know for the good of the bad is their starting quarterback but carter averages 3.0 yards after contact his 11.6 broken tackle rate ranked among the league leaders he's got this seven percent forced missed tackle rate as well so his evasion rate 19 percent. that's above superstars like jonathan taylor who is 16 percent nick chubb who is at 15 percent. again that's not to say that he's as good as or in the same vicinity as those players but that we continue to have through multiple seasons so much evidence suggesting that michael carter is a great athlete he's a big play machine he breaks tackles he forces guys to miss tackles and that's what you're looking for a player to do is to continue on the same path and the same trajectory that they suggested that they were on based on their collegiate performance he's also a guy who split 110 targets with ty johnson but required 50 fewer routes to get there he averaged 9.1 yards after the catch and ranked number two among all backs in receiving evasion rate so, I mean, I, I don't think that this is going to be a situation like the Devontae Freeman, Tevin Coleman situation when Coleman was drafted over Freeman back in 2015, in part because even though Tevin Coleman was a good prospect, it did have some good NFL seasons, certainly had some good NFL games. I mean, Brees Hall is a star. And so you just never want to have another star in the backfield with you it can't help but cut into everything that you're trying to do i mean it's going to cut into your workload in a massive way and yet there are scenarios here where even just the standalone value that you're likely to get from michael carter in this offense at his price really helps you but if Brees hall gets banged up and we know that some of these young guys do have that issue i mean rookies have problems with injuries it's a very diff different environment from a physicality perspective it's a very different environment from an overall time and workload perspective and just obviously you, you are exposed to the same types of luck and randomness that the veterans are exposed to in these early down backs and belco backs have high injury rates you and i have a ton of Brees hall in all formats and just like every other player we're not looking for an injury we're desperately hoping that Brees hall stays healthy and yet as you mentioned a huge percentage of our drafts are going to come out with one of these two players and especially as you start to move into redraft where you're allowed to cut and move on from a player michael carter is somebody that at his price you just have to have extremely high exposure to yeah uh, i would agree with that and particularly if you like you know pass on Brees hall and it's a hero rb or a zero rb build getting guys like um the other names we mentioned in gainwell but also getting carter they are fantastic elements to add to those rosters the honorable mention sean khalil herbert and dearness johnson dearness johnson feels like probably needs a trade to you know really get maximum upside unless there's injuries with the cleveland browns but khalil herbert is somebody who outperformed what david montgomery was able to do in that offense down the stretch when montgomery was out so he's somebody i find very interesting but there's two other names and i want to let you pick one of them ramon ray stevenson is somebody you've mentioned on a number of shows and the buzz around stevenson has been very very 
uh, I guess we'll say positive, but I remember, you know, last year around this time, he was somebody we were taking flyers on late in drafts, turned out to come on strong as the season went on. Obviously a, a big back, 230 pounds, very explosive, broken tackles, as many as you can really want. Outside of the guy we're talking about here and Javante Williams, then the other name is J.K. Dobbins, who is obviously, you hinted at the start, players who have missed some time through injury. That would fit him into that bracket. And he is somebody that I really like. I've been really positive about. So when you asked at the start, which one did I want to pick as my favorite? As we've talked through them, the listeners can probably hear that I'm battling with myself to even rank these in order. But Dobbins didn't get the call out based on his ADP being a lot higher than the other guys on this list. And uh, he, he also fits into that dead zone area, but fits the profile of a running back that we'd be looking to draft somebody in the like of uh, a DeAndre Swift who we recently talked about. But I'll, I'll let you hit one of them, Sean. Which is your favorite to talk about? Well, I'm going to let J.K. Dobbins go and encourage any listeners who still are, are kind of mind-boggled and trying to figure out why I would have him ranked where I do, why I would have so much exposure. Check this piece out. I think that it will answer some of your questions. I think that you'll be higher on Dobbins and his talent when you get finished reading. I mentioned Jamal Charles. I mentioned Barry Sanders in this piece. I'm not saying that J.K. Dobbins is those guys, but I think that the reason I mentioned those two players will be relevant and interesting to you. As we always say, we don't know for sure what the injury situation is. It sounds like Dobbins is going to be there, but we don't know. And if you're concerned about the injury risk, draft somebody else. Because, I mean, the range that these running backs are in, it's not like he's going to go out and score 30 points a game and give you a 10 to 12 point hammer over everybody else. So with that not in the range of you know, reasonable outcomes, make sure you draft with your own approach on injury risk and injury comfort. So that being said, J.K. Dobbins, pretty exciting. I think the Baltimore Ravens offense is going to score an absolute ton of points this year. But Ramondre Stevenson, as you mentioned, generating rave reviews in camp. He supposedly has slimmed down even though – he had the number two broken tackle rate in the NFL last year at his 230-pound size. And you hear Stevenson mentioned as the potential pass catcher, but James White struggling through injury now. Ben Gretsch will tell you that Ty Montgomery is going to come out and have a massive season this year in the White role. But what if it's Stevenson, right? He only played in 50% of the snaps on three occasions last year. He crested 20 points twice. He only ran 70 routes. And so again, we're talking about minuscule sample that you basically are looking at for fun, right? But the 26% target per route was identical to Anaji Harris, right? It was above Austin Eckler, above Leonard Fournette. In that tiny sample, he was extraordinary. Averaged 10.6 yards after the catch. Colin, you look at what Ramondre Stevenson can do. You look at this Patriots offense and how it should be more dynamic this year. This is just pure silliness, but it's impossible to not like have in the very tiny back of your mind this question of what could he do if he put James White's 2018 season with LeGarrette Blunt's 2016 season. And again, you know, Blunt goes for over a thousand yards and has 18 rushing touchdowns that year. So, so he's going to break the touchdown record for the NFL. I mean, we're talking about Ramondre Stevenson, RB1 overall, right? It sounds like it. It sounds like we're getting, you know, seven to eight receiving touchdowns. We're getting 18 rushing touchdowns. So we're, <laughs> we're in a pretty good place. I don't think we'll get to that point, but I do think that Ramondre, Ramondre Stevenson obviously has ascended in ADP, but I think that he is uh, somebody who, if he can get that full workload with the Patriots and the reports again are very, very positive. I think he can be an absolute elite level superstar running back in the NFL. So let's hope, Sean, that is the case. We'll see how it plays out. Obviously, Damian Harris is still there. There is competition in that backfield, but really fun running through those guys today. As I mentioned earlier, this will be in the show notes of today's show. The link will be there as well. So do have a full read of it. Read the J.K. Dobbins element. We did cover quite a bit of it, Sean, on the show, but there is other stats and information in there that will be beneficial to you to read through the entire piece that is up on rotaviz.com. 